Okay. And then just making sure that we're face. Oh, there we go. Okay, awesome. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us tonight for our Southwest CPC meeting. Um, I would like to call this meeting to order today, March 2nd, 2022. The time is 6 p.m. I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. We are live on Facebook and we're excited to always improve on our accessibility within our community. This is a recorded webinar where only panelists are able to speak or be seen on the meeting. So for those of you joining us um, who are attendees, I encourage you to participate with us via the chat or the Q&A section where CPC members will be keeping an eye out for that. Uh, we really do invite you to, um, to ask any questions that you may have that, um, you know, anything that's happening within your community, we really want to open that up. Um, and for those of us joining us officially on Facebook, please also place your questions and comments in the chat box and I'll also keep an eye on that. I will also like to extend, if you're interested in joining the Southwest CPC, please let us know in the chat or send us an email. We're looking to forward to expanding our membership. Um, but before we get started with our official business tonight, the Southwest community has been, unlike really any other time that I can remember, been directly affected and impacted by gun violence, property damage, and street racing that hurt and may have caused trauma to many of our children and students at George I. Sanchez. I would like to ask those on our meeting tonight that we hold a moment of silence for the recent tragedy and loss of the student, Andrew Burson, who was fatally shot at West Mesa High School, where our condol condolences go out to the parents and the family. Just taking another deep breath. <laughs> um, we recognize that tonight our community members may have questions and we thank our panelists for being here with us tonight to be open um, to those questions and also educate us on the topics. So tonight's topic is to address and learn more about the Traffic Enforcement Initiative and the Albuquerque Ambassador Program where many of our community members had a lot of questions last month and so we wanted to um, invite Lieutenant um, Garcia here with us tonight. And we also have Commander Joseph Byers, who will be talking about the Traffic Enforcement Initiative. So we will now begin um, our meeting and have roll call for our council members. There are a few of us that won't be making the meeting tonight to include Wanda Harrison, Andrea Lester Young, and um, David Ressa. So it is just myself <laughs> um, and Joseph Koloski, are you? If you can just say that you're here. I'm here. Thank you. And then we also have um, our newest member, Mona Varela, will, that might be joining a little bit later, um, but we're excited okay. for her to have joined us. Um, so now we moved for the approval of past minutes, where if there are no changes or additions, um, Joseph, is there a motion to approve the past minutes? Uh, I make a motion. Perfect. Awesome. So those, and I second that. So we'll go ahead and move forward. And um, now we move to the approval of the agenda where you can find the agenda on the city of Albuquerque's page. Um, um, I don't know if maybe, um, Kelly, if you can possibly place that in the chat um, so it can also be available. So do we have an approval for um, March's agenda if there are no changes or additions? Good. Perfect, so then I second that. So now we move on to our official business tonight um, where we have Commander Barraza, um, our new Commander Barraza, which we're excited to work with, um, to give us updates on the Southwest Area Command and possibly address some of the recent events as well. Um, so thank you again, Commander Barraza, for being here with us and supporting the Southwest CPC. Of course, thank you, Terry. Um, welcome everybody, I'm Commander Rene Barraza, I'm the Interim Commander for the Southwest Area Command. Um, I've been uh, in this position now for a little over two months, and uh, I can tell you it's been it's been kind of easy and, and difficult at times to get um, used to a different area command and wrap your brain around uh, what is going on in, in the different geographic area now. Um, but just like you said, Teresa, this last weekend was a pretty tragic weekend for the Southwest Area Command. Uh, nothing like I experienced for the last couple of months, uh, where 
uh, we had some gun violence uh, directly affect uh, you know children because they're really children, they're high school kids. Um, that impacted uh, all the students at West Mesa High School. Uh, so my prayers go out to all those students that are suffering with that trauma, also to the family of the victim. Uh, but I can tell you, I'm very proud to work for this organization that we have committed uh, men and women of the Oakley Police Department that continue to work hard every day when we have an incident like this. And we come together, we put our brains together, we put our, our law enforcement investigative um, strategies together. And that day I stayed working uh, the majority of the day, I did probably log off until about 7 p.m. Um, but that day, our investigative detectives did a phenomenal job. And um, I was notified uh, by those sergeants that took that 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 subject into custody. And I'll call him a subject because he's a, he's a young man, but um, the the person that shot the victim, um, they took him into custody shortly after 5 p.m. So I know that the shooting occurred somewhere about a little after 8 p.m. And with the great work of the men and women of the Albuquerque Police Department, especially our investigative uh, units and our homicide detectives, they were able to apprehend uh, the young man that took the life of that young man um, almost in less than, than nine hours. So uh, kudos to them. I'm very proud to be working with those. I, I, I give kudos to all the people that showed up to help us uh, with that. But again, you know, that this weekend was very tragic. We had some other shootings. We also had another homicide. Uh, I won't say the address, but it was actually in a park, uh, the far west of, of my area command. And, uh, you know, again, our, our investigative detectives are doing a phenomenal job to um, bring somebody to justice for that one. Because from what I understand, those, uh, those people involved in that shooting are also teenagers. They have, you know, 17, 18, 19, they still have a teenage years on them. They're young adults making really bad decisions. So um, it was very unfortunate. It's impacting our community uh, a lot, the gun violence. And then nonetheless, we had um, another incident where a, drag, uh, a, a gentleman, and I said gentleman, because this man is close to 50 years old, was drag racing another car and also hurt some children. So a lot, of, a lot of children were impacted this last week in my air command. Um, so, you know, we, with the help of our, our uh, traffic investigators uh, and the field officers, we were able to contain the scene. We were able to render aid to those injured ones that were injured to include uh, the, the suspect that's currently being detained. And Commander Veers can elaborate on that uh, a little later. But, you know, just to... Just to let you all know, um, the men and women of the Southwest Air Command, they're dedicated. Um, they, they follow my lead to make sure that we're focusing on all our efforts in the right areas of the Air Command to make sure that we're trying to address and encompass everything uh, that's public safety related in the Air Command. So yeah, those, those events are very tragic. They, they affected a lot of our community. So with that said, um, if anybody's on this, and on this chat, if, uh, if you are affected by this trauma and there's something that I missed, you can always reach out to me at the substation and I'll put my email in the group chat again. But we also have another division within uh, the city of Albuquerque, it's the Albuquerque Community Safety. Uh, they're very instrumental in, in some of these incidents to come out and help and be able to provide some services to those affected by this trauma. So. Um, I know uh, it's a fairly new program, a new, a new division that we utilize in public safety, but they're very instrumental in helping us uh, make sure that we reach out to the rest of the, the community that, that's affected by all these tra uh, traumatic events. So it's an opportunity community um, services. Thank you. And I also wanted to put that out there. We also do have the New Mexico Crisis and Access Line um, that you all can call. There's a warm line that you can also text um, if you would like to speak to somebody um, in regards to any type of support, uh, mental health or just self-care, um, which is really, really important. I do have a question and, and you know, with these re recent events that have happened, um, you know, with, with the bus rollover, are there any, you know, what, it, what are you all working on right now in support of like, addressing the drag racing, because that seems to happen a lot in the Southwest. There's been a lot of complaints since I've been a, you know, a CPC member. You. And, you know, is there, are there any changes that you all might be doing? Yes, that's a great question, Teresa. Um, 
and uh, partnering with, with Commander Viers and the Commander from the Valley, we've recognized the need to develop um, like a multi-agency uh, tactical plan to approach and, and actually address speeding, drag racing, and also the modified exhaust, because I get those complaints probably just as much as you do, Teresa. Um, so we have a, a, a weekly initiative on Sundays because for whatever reason on Sundays before I got here is one day that the that those enthusiasts that are speeding and drag racing amongst all our city, but really it was affecting the Valley Air Command on Central and it was, it was leading over to the Southwest Air Command. So every Sunday evening, we do have a tack plan of a, a group of officers, not only from the Southwest, but also from the Valley Air Command, but we can do it with the help of the officers that are directly under Commander Veers from the Traffic Division. Those, those officers, those detectives and those motor officers, they come in and work every Sunday to partner with us to make sure that we're addressing some of those speeding and drag racing issues. So we can do it alone because it's a coordinated effort between our, our, the field officers and then our, our motor officers that come out every Sunday. So we're, we are practically trying to address that. Um, and unfortunately, reality is we can't address the, the speeding and the drag racing 24-7. When we see one, when we see somebody that's 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 engaged in that kind of behavior, we do take action. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I can tell you about a week ago, one of my sergeants, you know, nonetheless pulled over a all-terrain vehicle that was being driven on one of our city roads, and that person was cited and his vehicle was towed. So anytime we get a chance and we see somebody violating uh, any kind of speeding or city ordinance uh, that puts somebody in danger like that we do take the necessary action that we have to. And we're partnering together to put these tax plans together. Um, you know, and I've always requested my officers to increase their, their traffic enforcement in different areas where I get complaints. Um, I put out speed trailers to try to deter the speeding. So that way people can, you know, look at a speed trailer and, and kind of check themselves and be like, oh, you know, what is my speed? Or what is the speed limit? Sometimes they just need that that visual reminder what the speed limit is and maybe what what was what what their speed is you know so we are taking a proactive approach to to address speeding and drag racing uh through the air command and i'll let commander veers uh touch base on that on, on a little bit of that um the coordinated efforts that we have with his division and the field officers thank you and i, and I know that our next topic is uh, traffic enforcement but before we <laughs> get there, um, you know, with the gun violence that has happened and, you know, please ask your questions in the chat or, or if the council members have any questions. Um, have you um, have you all reached out to the West Mesa High School and, and are there any efforts there in supporting the students? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, you know, I, I uh, even before this event, I drive by there all the time because we get complaints, not only from the commercial businesses in the area, um, but the speeding around the school. So we have reached out to the administration. We've reached out to APS uh, police out there. Um, I, I, went, I had a break today during my lunch hour and I drove by and, and you know, there's, a, there's a, some students showing their respects to, to the victim in that area, but um, we are partnering with APS police to make sure that we're conducting not only morning, but afternoon and late afternoon um, patrols and presence in the area to make sure nothing stirs up. Um, I think, and I know that um, our department right now, we don't have a school resource officers assigned to that school. However, we are working uh, with the school resources that we do have to be able to, um, you know, to show our presence there. Uh, we have very, very few amount of school resource officers, but uh, I think that partnership and showing our presence there with along with APS is gonna go a long way. Um, there is another question in the chat. Is there a way for public for the public to quickly report a racer or a very aggressive driver? Is it just calling 911 or 242 cops? Um, yes. If, if somebody sees a, a person that's driving aggressively, uh, you can always call 242 cops and, and, and actually uh, try to get a license plate, obviously, in a direction of travel and a good description uh, of the driver. Because uh, then when our our emergency communications dispatch center, they receive that call. Uh, they won't generate it for calls for service for an officer to respond, but they will broadcast it to all the officers working uh, citywide. So that way, 
you know, the more people will call if that person is related. And I can tell you that system works. Uh, personally, this last week, uh, we had an incident that I had to leave my office and uh, not only a block or two away from my substation, I, I, uh, I, I went to an intersection and, and it was a one crash vehicle. And this person was, um, unfortunately was intoxicated, driving intoxicated in the middle of the day. But nonetheless, when we looked at our computer automated, automated dispatch calls, uh, somebody had called that person, that female uh, driving possibly intoxicated in the area of Islet and Coors. So that communication of the community calling us and telling us that there's people that are racing and drag racing and aggressive driving and possibly, you know, drinking and driving during the day, doesn't matter what hours, always call us and we can always link them back to that behavior. And obviously that gives us a lot more um, evidence and, and documentation to prosecute those cases. So yeah, they can always call, again, the non-emergency number 242-COPS. Thank you. And we have another comment um, from another attendee that you know stated that it's been three years now that you could drive Northwest between Central and Cloudcroft by Pat Hurley Park is a drag slash speed race trap. Seems to be happening all night. Um, so what can we do about that? If there's a specific area, um, how does that area get addressed? That area gets addressed by increased and in random patrols by, by my field officers. Um, I know that area, I've, I've seen that complaint before. Um, I'm getting a couple of speed trailers that are that were actually uh, damaged and some that needed a little bit of, of, uh, of, of more modern batteries because they were deploying them, they would, they would uh, lose the charge. So I just got them out of the, uh, and, and retrieve them from the shop. So we're gonna deploy them. I can, we can deploy them with speed trailers. We also do um, enforcement in that area. This area specifically, is right off the area that we target on Sunday evenings um, on the on, on the drag racing and uh, speeding attack plan. Because Yucca Drive intersects with Central right by Old Course and it goes north from, from Central. So Yucca does get a lot of attention, but it's, it is it is sporadic um, by my officers. And I know that some of the traffic officers that the commander Veers deploys in our areas, even during the day, that area gets a lot of attention. So. We do try to, um, you know, put officers in those areas to address the speeding, and they do do that because uh, some of the stats that I see on the on the traffic stops, they're in that area. So I know that area is kind of. And, and matter of fact, on on uh, Yucca, there is a couple of speed bumps as you travel north uh, and north of Avalon. So there's some speed bumps that the city has implemented, put in that roadway um, to try to help with that and deter the the, the racing. Awesome, thank you. And and we can also submit a recommendation. So it might be working um, with you all community members. I put my email in the chat if you can reach out um, and we can hopefully start working on that um, and supporting our commander in addressing um, those areas. Um, are there any more questions um, before we move on to the, our next panelist? Okay, perfect. So now we're gonna go ahead and move up. Thank you, Commander Barraza. I really appreciate it, um, the information and the support and to hear all that you're doing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm gonna stay on. I'm just gonna mute myself. And if anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll be I'll be back on. Sounds good, thank you. You're welcome. All right, um, so now we have Commander Joseph Byers um, with the Traffic Enforcement Initiative. Thank you so much for being here with us and educating us on um, this initiative and how you can support the Southwest CPC. Um, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, happy to share with you guys kind of the um, approach the traffic division has taken. Um, obviously, other than all of our violent crime that we're experiencing in Albuquerque, one of the other major issues we're facing is traffic. Um, everybody's speeding and then the drag racing is a huge issue. Um, just to give you a little background on it and kind of where this is coming from and uh, why this initiative started was um, the last couple of years with COVID hitting, obviously a lot of businesses uh, were closed. So people weren't driving around as much. Everybody was more in a quarantine status. So there wasn't a lot of traffic on the roadway. Um, during that time, we saw a increase in bad driving such as speeding. Um, and that's kind of where the racing really kicked off. I mean, we had a racing issue before that, but I think this really ramped it up quite a bit. 
um, being that everything was closed. So we saw an increase in people finding something to do. So they would go out um, pretty much any day in the evenings, weekends, it didn't really matter when it was. And we just saw a significant increase in all of the drag racing across the city in numerous locations. Um, so we tried to put a plan together on how we were gonna tackle that. Obviously it's a huge safety concern for everybody. Um, those involved as well, it's um, you know just dangerous for anybody at that point. But what we did uh, starting out was the uh, administration really supported us, the mayor's office, the chief's office, uh, city council in getting us some extra resources within the traffic division. So we actually started for the first time that we've never had before a late swing shift traffic squad. And they actually work in the late evening hours. They work 4 p.m. till 2 a.m. in the morning and they work over the weekend. Um, so what this does is help us address some of those late night issues where people are drag racing, you know, throughout different parts of the city, Friday nights, Saturday nights, Sunday nights, um, kind of our peak days and times of when that was occurring. Um, and we've actually um, addressed quite a bit of the issues with it. I mean, obviously we can't solve all the problems in that short of a time frame, but uh, we've had some success with um, initiating that new traffic squad to be able to address those issues with the street racing and the exhaust and some of that stuff. Um, that unit, <clears throat> excuse me, ties into some of the efforts we're doing uh, in the downtown area, as well as that comes into the Southwest, as Commander Barasso was saying earlier. Um, we've partnered with them. Um, obviously there's strength in numbers. So having the Valley Area Command and Southwest Area Command partner with us, uh, we're able to put together some really good tech plans and operations to do at those peak times. And we've had a lot of success on Sunday nights, especially that seemed to be our biggest day of issue. Um, I know in the Southwest, the cons parking lot was one of the big issues where people would congregate there. They do donuts in the parking lot. Um, and then besides the racing and the exhaust, that's where other bad things can start happening. People get in confrontations with each other. There's fights. There could be a shooting, you know, things could stem from that. So we really wanted to address it head on and come up with an operation, which Commander Barasa, myself, and Commander Norris in the Valley, we all got together, um, put that initiative together to address those issues. And we've had a lot of success. Um, each weekend we've gone out, um, we've had well over 100 citations every weekend that we've gone out and done this for the past couple of months. Um, but I did notice uh, through some of the data that came in through the real-time crime center is a lot of the calls for service in that area regarding you know, shot spotter shootings um, other things like that have significantly decreased with that presence down in that corridor of where we're conducting that tech plan so not only are we trying to increase the traffic safety and reduce crashes and you know the racing and some of those issues quality of life issues such as the exhaust um, we've been able to reduce some of the other calls for service and potential violent crimes from happening as well. So that's one initiative we've started. Um, since January, um, as far as the traffic division goes specifically, uh, my entire division, we've kind of changed our enforcement efforts a bit and done something a little differently than we've ever done before. Um, traditionally, the traffic division is responsible for responding to calls for service regarding traffic crashes whether that be you know, the minor fender benders or any injury crashes. We also respond to the uh, serious injury and fatal crashes that occur in the city of Albuquerque. Um, so what we've done is we've kind of reduced the number of crashes that we're responding to. And instead of being more reactive of just coming, taking these reports, doing the investigations and moving on to the next one, um, we're taking the approach of increasing the traffic enforcement and education to hopefully change driver behavior in Albuquerque to ultimately reduce the crashes overall and reduce the fatals. Um, and how this came about was um, I pulled the data over the last six years for the Albuquerque Police Department as far as traffic enforcement and traffic fatalities. And there's been nationwide studies that have proven this, but I wanted to pull the data for our city and our department to see if it coincided with that and it did. Um, the more issued citations there are, the less fatal crashes will occur. Um, and that's been a study done nationwide. Um, you can look up plenty of research online about it. Um, so I pulled our data for six years and six years ago, we were having crashes, uh, fatal crashes in the 40s per year. 
and our set traffic citations were significantly higher than they are now. And the last two years, we broke our record of fatal crashes. So for last year example, our high was 85 fatal crashes. So in six years, we went from 40 fatal crashes to 85 fatal crashes. Um, but with that, the traffic citations were actually down just as much and the fatal crashes went up. So as much as they doubled, the traffic citations decreased by that much, 50%. So with that direct correlation and the data to support it, uh, we decided to push our enforcement efforts to work on changing that driving behavior. So um, we've requested more PSAs to the traffic division so they can help the field um, with those traffic crashes that we would normally respond to and take those reports for those individuals that are involved um, to free up the traffic officers more to conduct that enforcement and do those operational plans um, to hopefully change the driving behavior. So that's really what the initiative we're doing is all about, is reducing the number of fatalities, changing driving behavior, and just making the streets safer overall. Um, and I think over the past couple of years, especially with COVID, um, reducing the number of traffic stops, citizen contacts, people being isolated, um, people's driving behavior getting worse with the streets being more open and less traffic being out there. Um, we just really need to push it to the citizens that you know, that behavior is unacceptable. We're not going to allow people to run amok on the streets and make it dangerous for everybody else. So, you know, we're really stepping up the traffic enforcement. Let them know if you drive, you know, inappropriately, you're going to get a citation. Uh, if it meets the requirement, then you'll even be arrested if it's reckless. Um, you know, we're going to do what we need to do to, you know, work on changing that. So um, just a brief rundown um, of what we're doing with that, just to give you an idea. Um, the traffic division, a lot of our stuff we do is data driven. So we don't just send officers out and just randomly do patrols to do traffic enforcement. Uh, we use a lot of data of where there's a lot of crashes, where there's a lot of reports of people running red lights, speeding, racing, things of that nature. And we deploy our resources to those areas specifically to address those problems. A lot of the data can come from the speed trailers, um, things of that nature, or just officers know there's a lot of crashes in this area, so they'll go to that area as well. Um, but officers respond to these areas, conduct these operational plans, um, and we've actually seen success so far in the two months that we've been doing this. Um, so far, we've done uh, a central corridor attack plan. A lot of uh, crime occurs along the central corridor, um, so we actually use an approach called DDAX. It's a data-driven approach to traffic and crime safety. Um, so basically what that is, is you overlay your crash data with your crime data, and there's a correlation of traffic enforcement being done in that area with officer presence can obviously change driving behavior, reduce crashes, but also deter crime in that area. So if we can deter crime and reduce traffic crashes, it's kind of a win-win situation. So we've been doing the central tech plan for two months. Um, January and February, and we've issued almost 3,000 citations just on Central. And that's all the way from 98th Street to Tramway uh, along Central. Uh, there's been 42 arrests made, uh, misdemeanor and felony, along that corridor in those two months just by the traffic division as well. So you can see the efforts um, just along Central have increased quite a bit. Um, once a month, we also do a freeway operation, and then we also do um, a DDAX operation, which uh, last month for February was in the Valley Area Command along I-25 in Montano. Um, so each month it rotates to wherever that hot spot is, uh, as far as robberies, um, aggravated assaults, any of those type of crimes that overlay with uh, crash data. And we move our resources to those hot spots and uh, increase traffic enforcement um, for that approach. So these are some of the things that we do um, just to you know, push our enforcement efforts out there for this traffic initiative. Um, and I will say it's pretty early, it's only two months in, but uh, just to give you an idea, this time last year, as of March 2nd, 2021, we had 10 fatalities in the city of Albuquerque. Um, this year, 2022 to today's date, we're at five. So we've already reduced year to date, 50% our fatalities for the city of Albuquerque. So if we can continue this enforcement effort, um, the data would show that this increased traffic enforcement could change the driving behavior and hopefully reduce 
traffic fatalities overall. So that's really the big push. Uh, and we're just, you know, trying to be everywhere we can and work as many days and hours and different time frames uh, to accomplish that. So it's very flexible. The officers adjust schedules. They work overtime under grant funds that are provided through the federal government um, to, you know, do it under overtime. Uh, just to help get more officers out there and get more enforcement. So as much as we can do, we're trying to do. Um, and that's that's kind of where we're at at this point. Um, and just so it's noted, I took note of some of the comments in there about Yucca Central and Cloudcroft, uh, the 98th Street and some of that. I took some notes so I can uh, kind of work on developing some tack plans for my guys to go hit those areas. For those of you who had shared those comments, um, we'll definitely look into that. Um, another way you guys can report stuff traffic related is through 311. Any traffic related 311 complaints uh, get sent to me. And I can also provide you guys my email. So anybody who wants to send me an email about it, or if you want to go through 311, we address those directly. And then there's always a response given of what we did to address that issue, what the outcome was, things of that nature. So I'd be happy to assist with that, give you guys my email and kind of go from there. Thank you so much for all of that information. And it's it's good to know that you all are supporting um, the police officers with like the overtime and having those grants available for them. Um, and I'm just reading the comments. <laughs> oh, uh, one of the comments is, can this research that you just shared with us be shared um, publicly? Or where can um, that- it's, it's on the internet. I mean, if you yeah. just Google it, anybody can find it. It'd be the same stuff I looked at. I don't have any special place that I get it from. Uh, you can just uh, research DDACS, D-D-A-C-T-S. Um, that'd be one place to go or just traffic enforcement and fatalities. If you Google any of that, a lot of information will come up as far as uh, the data I was speaking about. I have one question, sir. Um, just wondering, there, will there be side benefits to this program as well, such as uh, finding people with felony warrants or stolen cars or is that expected by APD? Yes, that's a great question actually. Um, so part of the, so if, for example, the central corridor stuff I had mentioned, we'd had 42 arrests out of the traffic division in just that two month period we've been doing it. Um, traffic stops are a great way to catch criminals. Um, obviously their mode of transportation is typically a vehicle which could be stolen uh, may or may not be stolen. They could be going to a crime, from a crime, whatever that case may be. They could have warrants, you know, DWI offenders, things of that nature. Uh, so those 42 arrests encompass what exactly what you're talking about. Some of them were in stolen cars. Uh, some of them were for DWI. Some of them had felony warrants. Guns were recovered out of that. Uh, so it's a lot broader scope than just issuing tickets um, as people traditionally view you know, traffic officers as well, they're just trying to write a ticket to generate revenue, uh, which is actually false because the city doesn't collect any money off of traffic citations. They're all state statutes. So we don't actually make any money off of traffic citations. So they're purely done to just enforce the law and change behavior. But um, yeah, typically the <clears throat> traffic officers on these stops do catch offenders. Uh, sometimes they're in progress offenders. Sometimes they um, have warrants for stuff and um, as, as I spoke about, so but that was a great question, yes. And this is probably a safe way also to for the police to come across those sort of people when they may not be armed or they may not be expecting or? Yes, I mean, in, instead of responding to the incident while it's occurring, I mean, it's through a traffic stop, so um, changes the dynamics a little bit. Uh, traffic stops are still one of the most dangerous things an officer can do. Uh, just because there's a lot of unknown factors, but um, it, it takes them away from a residential element where they can barricade or, you know, be armed or have multiple people, things of that nature. So, um, yes, it does change that quite a bit. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kelly. Great question. Right. Well, I don't see any more um, questions in the chat. Um, but if you do have any questions as we move on to the next topic, please feel free to put it in the chat and um, we are happy to address it. I also just wanted to say thank you to our counselors, Clarissa Pena and Luis Sanchez for joining our meeting tonight. Thank you so much for being here and supporting the Southwest CPC. 
Um, so with that being said, we're now gonna move um, to our next pal panelist. Um, we had a lot of questions last month in regards to the Albuquerque Ambassador Program. And so we're happy and uh, to invite Lieutenant Jennifer Garcia to um, go over the Ambassador Program and also educate us as well as answer any questions if you all might have some still linger lingering from last meeting. And so thank you so much, Lieutenant Jennifer Garcia for being here with us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's uh, really a pleasure to be included in this and to talk about this topic. Um, I don't know if anybody had a chance to review my bio, but I grew up in Albuquerque. I am native to Albuquerque. I also went to school in the Southwest Area Command from elementary through high school. So I sympathize with what the community over there is going through. Um, I am going to share a screen. It's a very, very basic PowerPoint, but to give you a little bit of information about the ambassador program. And let me see here. I'm having a hard time getting the whole thing on. Okay. So this was taken at the press conference that we had for the ambassador program um, on May 5th of 2021. We went live, started working on the program. It was something that Chief Medina decided to develop in the later part of 2020. But what we found when we were going through the um, demonstrations that you know not only occurred here just in Albuquerque, but throughout the whole country, is that we needed to form a relationship because without forming relationships, we were never going to bridge the gap between law enforcement and the community that felt that they didn't have a voice with us. So the program is to assist different communities. We have a list of those communities and I'll go over those shortly. And then it's to provide a liaison between law enforcement with these designated groups. Historically, there are communities that have not had an opportunity to have a voice with law enforcement. So this is a means to give those communities a voice. And I probably jumped the gun, oops. I probably jumped the gun a little bit, but uh, we wanna build trust. We wanna show that we're human. A lot of times we forget, and I can even admit to this growing up, I knew officers, but I saw them as officers. I didn't see them as people. So we wanted to make sure that we show that we are people. We're not just a person in um, any uniform. And then to be a voice for minority groups. This is the mission statement for the investor program. And it's to preserve the peace and protect our community through community oriented policing with fairness, integrity, pride, and respect. Our vision statement is we envision a safe, secure community where the rights, history, and culture of each citizen is valued and respected. We want to do this by collaborating with the community to identify and solve public safety concerns and improve the quality of life. And as I mentioned, we have 10 different groups that are part of our ambassador communities. We have Asian American or AAPI, we have Native American, we have our seniors, our US veterans, our faith base, we have Hispanic, refugee, African American, our LGBTQ+, and our ADA community. We also recognize that, as you can see from the screen, these are the personnel, the officers or the supervisors that are assigned to these groups, but we recognize there's a lot of intersectionality between the groups. So you can be part of the Hispanic community, you can be a senior and you can be a US veteran. So we keep our, our ambassadors in the loop. We have monthly meetings with the chief of police where we share information because again, you can be part of several of these communities and we wanna make sure that we're all keeping in touch with each other. The process to be selected for an ambassador 
is that these are all volunteer positions. Every single person on this page has a full-time job. It is not the ambassador program. So they volunteer to do this as a collateral duty. They had to submit a letter of interest. They had to go through a panel. What we found when we were doing the interviews is that I believe every single person was already doing some type of outreach outside of their job. So they may be involved with Special Olympics and doing that on their own, which gives me, I guess, some comfort to know that everybody who selected to be part of this really is passionate about it. They also got to select their community. We did have a few officers who said, I just want to be involved. I'm okay. Just put me where you need me. I'm, I'm there to fill a gap. But we allowed them to select where they wanted to work. And the reason for that is, is because we want them to be 100% truly invested. If they are not invested, this program is not going to be successful. And I am the, the program director, the program coordinator. My contact information is there on the screen. You're more than welcome to contact me at any time. Some of the things that we do are we attend community block parties. We've had several of those in the Southwest. We um, go out to cultural events. So for uh, Indigenous Persons Day, we went out for that and we just partnered with the community. Um, and I don't know if I'm, there we go. Okay, we partnered with the community. We were there and we had officers present to take reports just in case anybody who attended the celebration um, wanted to make a missing persons report because we know that there is a big concern specifically in New Mexico, all throughout the country, but really a lot here, of uh, missing and murdered indigenous persons, specifically women. And so we wanted to be there to support the community. One of the things that the chief has allowed me to do is kind of mold the program to be what I think it should be. He gave me some guidelines, but I'm allowed to move forward. And what I like to tell the community is this is not an APD program. This is the APD community ambassador program. We are here to serve the community. The community is not here to serve us. We are here to collaborate with the community, but what my ambassador should be going out and doing is making contacts with members of their community, bringing that information back that they get and sharing it with officers. We recently received information about resources for seniors. So our senior ambassador shared that information with the entire department. Now, if these community members want information from us, of course, we're gonna provide that. But we are not here to push our agenda on you. We are here to take the information from you, share it with the community, I'm sorry, share it with our officers and make ourselves better. We can't do that alone and we don't know what the community needs, which is why we ask for the monthly contact. And that's a very brief description of what the program is in a nutshell but I'm more than happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Is there any way that, I, I've asked this several times, but is there any way that we can collaborate with you all in supporting you with, with your mission as well? Because we kind of serve like the same purpose, right? And like really bringing the community together, collaborating and really bridging that gap between APD and our community, which is why one of the main reasons why we host um, well, now virtual, but it, it used to be in person, obviously. Um, but how can we support you and vice versa? Well, there's various ways. A lot of it is just putting us in contact with maybe organizations that we may not be familiar with. When we started the program, I was cold calling people. I was Googling like LGBTQ+. I'm not a part of that community, so I don't know who to contact. So I was Googling, going through the phone book, um, just cold calling people, introducing myself and telling them about us. So if there's somebody that you know, an organization you know, put them in contact with the ambassador. And I know that I had the list up there, but you can also go to the City of Albuquerque Police Department website and all the ambassadors, if you scroll down under community outreach, all the ambassadors contact information is on there and there's a little bio of each one. 
Um, the other thing is, if you know somebody who needs help, please reach out to the ambassador. They may not be able to help that individual per se, but they can put them in contact. An example is we did have somebody from the refugee community. Um, his car was repossessed. He had made a lien through a organization that helps him. Um, they had purchased a car, it was an old rental car. It was repossessed because it was reported embezzled. He did a lot of legwork. He spent three days working on this on his off time. It turned out that the rental car company had submitted it as embezzled, never that they had sold it. So it was fraudulent and they were able to get his car back. But without that, in the, without that liaison with APD, we don't know how long it would have taken. And three days is a long time to be without a car, but I can't imagine being without it much longer. And especially not being from this country, you know, who do you reach out to? The other thing we've done is we've helped with the Mexican consulate, our ambassadors with them, worked with them to develop the posters that we have posted in the substations and also in our holding cells. They are in Spanish. So somebody knows the services that they can provide. And that's just phenomenal that they can do that. We want to make sure that everybody here, whether you know they're in handcuffs or not, they know their rights and they know where the resources are. So those are just a couple examples. I'm excited to learn about that. I did not know that. Um, the Consulado de Mexico, they're an amazing organization. And so I'm happy to hear that you all are collaborating with them. Um, and outside of the CPC, I work for the, for the New Mexico Coalition Against Domestic Violence. So any way that we can support with our programs locally, please let me know. Um, we would be happy to support if somebody calls and is experiencing a domestic violence situation. Um, all right, well, I don't see any questions as much as we had last month. I'm telling you, the whole chat was filled with so many questions about the ambassador program. And so I was hoping um, to have them come in and um, give them the support. Uh, we're really trying to open the CPC meetings to community members um, to express their concerns, um, you know, their needs or what they're seeing in the community. So hopefully we can also be of support um, just like yourself. And so thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, really grateful for the information. And is it possible for you to put your information in the chat again? Um, just yes. thinking. Absolutely, I will do that. And um, I do see one question. Oh, you're right. Um, and yes, so we do have plans. The question is, do we have plans to uh, participate in the Juneteenth celebration? Yes, we do. Thank you for that. We're looking forward to it. Um, hopefully we can have a big, fun um, event this year, but yes, we are super excited to be a part of that. So thank you. And there's another question. I'm so sorry, I didn't see it in the Q&A. I saw it light up <laughs> after you said that. So thank you, Kate, for that invitation. And um, I put your question in the chat and it looks like another panelist. Um, are there other programs in surrounding communities? Um, if you can maybe um, expand on that so we can support you. I'm sorry, can you elaborate? Yeah, the question is just, are there other programs in surrounding communities? Just not, to see, like, not that I'm aware of. Um, no, not, not that I'm aware of. This is a unique program here to New Mexico. I have spoken with law enforcement and other states that have something similar it's not the same as ours but again everything is different everything's unique one thing i didn't mention is that our ambassadors are directed to and i, I mean i did kind of say that they're directed to learn from their community what they want but each community is different so like for the native american community one thing they wanted from um, lieutenant bartlett is they just wanted to do outreach and so he showed up one day and they walked around and I believe it was in the Southwest Area Command and handed out um, toiletries and provided pamphlets. And it's just, it's, it really is unique to each individual community. We don't wanna make it a one size fits all because that's not appropriate. Albuquerque is way too diverse for that. I did also wanna um, just, um, 
add that there are block parties that are currently happening as well. Um, you can head over, I think, to the city's page, and um, I can also reshare on our Facebook page. Had to put the plug in there, so please follow us. Um, where there are block parties that have a lot of resources for community members, and you can also um, get in contact with those that are here. The CPCs are also um, are going to be at those meetings. Um, and Sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. Is there a community member that raised their hand? I'm not sure I don't see that on my end, um, but if there are any questions, if you can place them in the chat, that would be great. Um, and thank you, Commander Barraza, for that information there. All right, well, I don't see any more questions. I really appreciate the time um, that you've taken today. I know, and I also recognize it's Ash Wednesday. Um, thank you all for being here with us tonight and having this conversation and we hope to see you all next month. Um, please, please let us know if there's any topic that you would all like us to have next month and things that are happening in our community. The Southwest has been impacted by a lot of things recently, so make sure to please take some self care. There is a New Mexico crisis and access line um, that you can call if you need any support. Um, I also would like to thank Kelly and Martisa for all of their support in hosting these meetings um, and our council members. And again, I would like to extend, um, if you are interested in being a part of the Southwest CPC Council, please um, let me know or Kelly or Martisa. Um, we are really looking to expand um, our membership or council. And so let us know if that might be something of interest. And for those of you that placed any information in the chat as well, um, maybe we might be, well, we will be connecting um, with the Southwest CPC and submitting a recommendation for those areas that are, are of concern. And um, we're grateful to Commander Joseph Byers for all the information today for the Traffic Enforcement Initiative and Lieutenant Jennifer Garcia, and as well as our new commander, Renee Barraza. Thank you all so much for being here with us tonight and we hope to see you all next month. Please follow us on Facebook um, and let us know how we can support you in the meantime. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you for all your support. I appreciate you guys. Absolutely, likewise. Everyone have a great week. Thank you. Thank have you. a good evening, everyone.